Hi, it's Gun Beta, and today I'm going to try to restore this Atari 1050 disk drive. This is actually the one you briefly saw in my other Atari 1050 repair video, and I actually stole the power jack from this one, so I'm going to have to replace that. And if you remember the video I did, this is the one that looked pretty rusty and uh, dirty from the inside. So we're going to have to do a lot of cleaning. It has some spots on the plastic case that don't really look nice. This seems to have melted at some point, so I'm probably going to file that down a bit. Yeah, things like that. Restoration time. The drive did actually work when I tried it before I removed the power jack from it. It was pretty loud, but uh, yeah, that's probably because it is super dirty. Yeah, this is an Atari 1050, which is the standard disk drive for the Atari XL series. Uh, serial number 7VDFF4776524. First things first, we are going to have to remove some screws. There are six screws in these, I think, that hold the case parts together. We should be able to lift this out. There we go. The front bezel, the brown part, is uh, clipped to the white part. Yeah, and as you can see, it is pretty dirty, even the circuit board is dusty and uh, yeah, I'm going to take this fully apart. The whole drive mechanism is only held in by uh, the case, so we should be able to just lift this out, set it aside carefully. And there is our rusty RF shield. We're going to have to do some work on this, definitely. Yeah, this is completely rusty. You can even see rust on the voltage regulators. Uh, maybe it was stored in a moist basement or something like that. So first thing, obviously, is to take the whole circuit board out of the plastic case. Which is easy because it's not screwed down. Pretty nice construction, actually. The RF shield that goes over all the main ICs. I am going to have to unclip that. There are these little metal tabs that you can twist to hold it in place. And I think on some drives it is also soldered in. Thankfully not on this one. So we are going to remove that and we should be able to get this off. There we go. Ooh, okay, it's rusted beyond recognition. <coughs> Not so much from the inside here, so it probably there was some uh, moisture leaking in from the top side, I guess. Because the top side of this cage is super rusty. The inside not so much, but the bottom side is. So probably something. It rained on it, I don't know. I think the first thing I want to do is to replace the power jack here. And I have a replacement now, thanks to a generous donation. That should hopefully fit in here. We are going to clean off the old solar from these pads and then solder it in. And I'm just going to use some solder wick. I'm doing this so that the old solder doesn't mix with the solar I'm going to use to solder this back in. which could uh, potentially lead to cracks or temperature differences. And yeah, there's a lot of physical stress on these connectors. So you always want to make sure they are soldered in the best way possible. Yeah, I put some Kapton tape on this one because I had issues with shorted uh, connections there on the last one I repaired. So just to rule that out, I added some tape. Holding this down a bit while I 
solder so it stays in the correct position. There we go, that should do. The bottom side actually looks really clean. The whole board looks super clean from the bottom side, which is nice. Now for the first function test, uh, I got my multimeter out and I got my self-made PSU out that powers an Atari and a disk drive. And yeah, this seems to work if we get the correct voltages. So we basically should have uh, two separate voltage rails. One is 5 volts and one is 12 volts, which is this one actually. Uh, there's the 7812 here and the 7805 here, which should output 5 volts. Yep, and that's spot on 5 volts. And our power socket seems to work fine. You can maybe see the LED if I wiggle this. It doesn't do any weird stuff. So we have a good connection there. That's good. I'm especially concerned about the power socket because, uh, yeah, that was one of the faults I didn't find right away on the last repair. This one seems to work fine. So on with the next steps. Now for cleaning this up a bit, I think I want to wipe the dirt off the top of the chips at first and then remove them and actually clean this in the sink because it is super dirty. I'm going to take pictures of the chips positions so I don't get those confused. And I'm using distilled water, just a kitchen towel to uh, clean the tops of the chips here. Obviously, water is always kind of risky on electronics, but in this case, uh, we are going to use lots of it because there's a lot of dirt on here. And yeah, I just want to give these an initial cleaning. Uh, we don't want to have water inside these adjustable resistors and capacitors that are on here. I think these blue ones are multi-turn uh, potentiometers, basically, adjustable resistors. And this is uh, an adjustable capacitor, I think. Don't want too much water getting in there. The rest of the circuit board should be waterproof for the most part. Yeah, it actually looks a lot better now already. The sockets look relatively clean, actually, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think let's get this into the sink and uh, clean it with some warm water and some dish soap. And then afterwards, I'm going to rinse it with distilled water and lots of alcohol. Yeah, so just giving this a bit of a clean. Distilled water. Because that doesn't leave any residues that we don't want. And then alcohol, literally soak it in alcohol to uh, dispel the water basically. I'm going to leave it to dry uh, upside down so any remaining water can just drop. While the circuit board fully dries, I'm just going to soak the case parts in some warm water with some dish soap and some window cleaner in it to remove all the dirt from those. And I'm also going to put these uh, shield parts in there. And the shield parts are going to go into some white vinegar to hopefully remove some of the rust, at least after that. And leave them in there for a couple of hours. 
So I'm uh, going to set this aside. So the circuit board turned out relatively clean. <laughs> At least we got the mud off. I'm going to replace all the electrolytic capacitors on here now. And I'm also going to replace the slightly rusty voltage regulators. I'm going to use 7805 and 7812 S versions, which are regular linear voltage regulators, they are only rated at a higher amperage. So these are, I think, the standard ones rated at 1 or 1.5 amps, and I'm going to use the S variant, which is rated for 2 ampere, which uh, technically doesn't really matter, but it is always good to have some headroom in case uh, the motors jam or something like that and there's a large current surge, which might actually happen on these drives. Uh, yeah, I'm going to replace one capacitor at a time, taking note of the orientation, the polarity of the capacitors that were originally in here, and I'm going to use the same capacitance for each one. Uh, for the voltage rating, I'm going to go the same voltage or a slightly higher voltage than the original voltage that was in here. You don't want to go lower voltage, obviously, because uh, yeah, the voltage rating basically indicates how much voltage these can take until they break. I'm not going to go into much detail because I've done this a lot of times. I'm just going to do it. I'm using my desoldering station and my regular soldering iron and yeah. Let's just do it. You always want to go with a uh, name brand, good capacitors. I am usually using Panasonic FC capacitors in elderly hardware like this. For these larger caps here, uh, there's different configurations actually. Some of these drives have uh, 6,800 microfarad capacitors in all these positions. Some of them have a 4,700 microfarad capacitor here which this board has. I'm just going to replace same with same on here. Usually these large capacitors don't go bad as quickly as the uh, smaller ones, but of course they are old too and uh, the electrolyte slowly dries up no matter what you do, if you use them or not. Uh, it's a good idea to replace old electrolytic capacitors. I know that's a controversial thing, because some of the older capacitors are really well made and people tend to leave them in place. But I'm on the other side of the spectrum. I think modern capacitors always are a good idea in old hardware. Because if these leak on the circuit board or if they short out, you might damage the old hardware. I don't want to risk that. Okay, recapping time. <laughs> These larger capacitors are held in with some dabs of hot glue, I think, uh, to prevent them from vibrating too much, uh, which I'm going to add in later. Uh, usually you can just uh, put some alcohol on the hot glue and it should come off really easily. Yeah, which it does in this case. Uh, this is old and brittle as well, which does help with removing. And as you can see, these footprints have different spacings. So you can use uh, this hole and one of these holes, depending on which size of capacitor you want to use. So that's pretty handy. Usually modern caps are a bit smaller than the older caps with the same ratings. Maybe for the voltage regulators now. So this whole metal bracket acts as the ground connection as well as, as a heatsink. So I'm going to add some thermal paste to this pad on the voltage regulator. This is my 78S05 and I'm just going to add some of that. These have the same pinout obviously as the other ones. So I'm just going to stick that in there. Put the screw through there and I'm going to screw it in place before I solder it so the solder joints are not getting any extra stress. Now we just solder it in 
and we should be good to go. Connection to the heat sink and to ground should be there. And the same goes for the 7812. It's always a good idea to re-solder the joints on the connectors that get physical stress. So I'm just going to add some flux here, I just did that, and uh, re-solder each joint on these SIO connectors. Just heating them up briefly and reflowing them. Yeah, I think that's all the capacitors replaced, or all the electrolytic capacitors at least. The other ones, the ceramic ones and uh, plastic polymer ones, usually don't make any problems. I am going to put some contact cleaner into the sockets before I put the chips back. But these look really clean, so there's no rust or corrosion on any of the contacts, which is a good sign. And yeah, the chips look relatively clean now after quickly wiping them. The legs look clean, so I'm not too worried about these being affected by all the dirt. I'm just going to put them back in the correct positions with the uh, notch facing in the correct direction. There's a notch on the silk screen and on the sockets. Usually the sockets and the silk screen line up, but sometimes they don't. In this case, everything's in the correct orientation, so there should be nothing to worry about there. I'm going to add a bit of hot glue to the capacitors like there was before, so they don't shake too much. And that should conclude work on the circuit board itself. Let's power this up and see if my voltages are still correct. So, powering this on. And let's see what my voltages tell me. That's my 12. And that's my 5. So, that's all hunky-dory. Power switch still works, none of the capacitors blew up. I think we should be good on this board. Let's take a look at the drive mechanism. I absolutely don't want to soak this in water or alcohol or something uh, completely because there's motors that might lose lubrication and uh, get damaged and things like that. So I'm going to go in here with Q-tips, I guess, and brushes and see if I can clean up most of the gunk. And then I'm going to re-lubricate it, clean the read-write head and hope for the best.
So we're slowly getting there. There's a lot of filth in this. Uh, at this point I want to clean the reed right head. I'm just using a Q-tip soaked in alcohol. The reed right head is this white thing with the stripe on there. So there's our reed right head and I'm just using a Q-tip carefully wiping that and the pad on top there that is supposed to push the disc down. Uh, or hold it in orientation at least. I'm also going to clean that a bit. And you can see these rails here that the head moves on. These should be cleaned with alcohol and Q-tip as well and then re-lubricated. I'm usually using uh, silicon grease for that because I think that's what was originally used for lubricating these drives. Wow, this is really filthy. And I'm also going to apply the same to all the moving parts like this, where our closing mechanism is, and uh, there's some other spots like here. I think I might add a dab here for like, like liquid silicon grease to help this rotate and not make much noise. This is just to keep the disc in orientation, basically. This clamps into the disc when you insert it. So, tiny dab of silicon grease on these rails. And on some other moving parts. This must be the dirtiest drive I've ever seen, actually. This here is a micro switch that uh, this indentation on this rod closes whenever the drive is closed. So uh, I'm going to put some contact cleaner in there to make sure that works. And the mechanism should technically be pretty smooth now. The belt actually seems pretty good in this one, so I'm not going to replace that. Uh, that would go on this capstan kind of thing, and this is the spindle that actually gets spun. <laughs> I'm cleaning the, the flywheel thing, so... Because, yeah, as you can see, there's quite a bit of dirt on there. And I'm doing the same on the other side. Don't want too much alcohol to get on the rubber, because that is going to make it more brittle. So I'm using water to clean that. Yeah, that seems pretty good, actually. And this should, of course, fully dry before we power this on. Yeah, that's better. Yeah, there was some dirt on that thing. I think I got most of it off at this point. It's the next morning in the lab. I actually let the case parts and the circuit board dry overnight. And I guess it's time to do some repairs on the plastic case. The top part that I left the brown bezel on to not risk uh, cracking these clips actually looks pretty nice, except for some stains that are still on there and this uh, glued spot here that I need to... I think I'm just going to file that down in a second. But we're going to have to do some work on the bottom part of the case so this bottom side, there's a lot of cracked things. Actually, these metal standoffs, uh, one of those fell out when I washed this. As you can see, these posts are cracked. I'm going to try to glue these back together. And also these two standoffs broke off. Uh, that's where the circuit board sits on. So I'm going to do some gluing on this and try to fix all 
the cracks and glue back on the broken parts. And I'm using this plastic welding glue, which is Uhu Plus Special. I filled that in a non-branded bottle because my original bottle of it uh, clogged, so uh, I couldn't use the nozzle on it. So I'm, j I'm just using this uh, new bottle here, but it's the same glue that I used all the time. Pretty good stuff. It uh, dissolves the plastic, so it forms a weld bond once it dries and evaporates. I think I actually want to start with these posts. I decided to use some cloth pins uh, to hold the cracks together. I think that should be just enough force uh, to not break the plastic and to make it hold again. So I'm just putting some of this glue in these cracks and uh, then of course put the metal rod back in there. Should go in here like so. Uh, these metal rods, there's these bumpers that sit on those that hold the drive mechanics actually. And for these parts you can usually find the correct orientation for these by just sliding the parts on there. And I already determined that. We're hopefully going to end up with a completely repaired case here. So there we go. This is how I want to leave this to settle. I hope these cracks can be glued back together. I'm not too worried about these posts because usually the glue really makes them sturdy again. Should be as good as new, if not better, <laughs> afterwards, hopefully. So let's see if this works. And then after the glue has settled, I'm going to put the circuit board in there and the drive mechanic on top and connect everything and we're going to see if that thing works. I left these metal parts in the vinegar overnight and uh, yeah, some of the rust comes off. Not all of it, unfortunately, but it should at least have neutralized the corrosion. At this point, uh, I'm going to wash these and dry them and then put them back. So this should have cured. Yep, that's much better. So I'm putting these rubber bumpers back on, which fit on these standoffs. I'm putting this back in. And there are these clips here that hold it down. And I'm going to add some contact cleaner to all the connectors on this drive and try to make sure that they go in the correct positions, in the correct orientation. So I think this is the way these should be connected. This one facing the red wires facing to the front. On this one, there's one connector, the one with the colored wires, that goes in the other way around. The others are like so. Usually these stay in the position they were in because these wires are a bit stiff. So I hope I have these connected correctly. I'm going to link a thread in a forum that has pictures of the positions in the video description. So you can figure that out yourselves. Yeah, I think at this point we can do a function test of this and connect it to an actual Atari computer. Let's see if this works. I hope so. Okay, it initialized. That's a good sign, I guess. So I have an Atari 1050 diagnostic disks here that I'm going to try. <laughs> it's making some weird noises. Uh, let's try to boot that up. Holding down the option key should hopefully boot the disk, I think. Does it though? 
No, it doesn't. Yeah, so I realized I had this set up to be another drive ID. This sliding switch here should be in the position facing outwards, uh, both of these sliding switches. So, yeah, I put that in the correct position and now we can actually boot up disks. Let's run some diagnostics. So here's my 1050 diagnostics disk booted up. Executing motor start test. And this is actually a disk that was written on the other drive I repaired. So uh, if this passes all the tests, it should actually be aligned correctly. Ah, oh, nice. Okay, that passes. Let's try the troubleshooting options. Speed calibration. Yeah, and it's actually pretty good. Should be 208.3 plus minus 1 and it's 209.1 and running. Yeah, it's running well. Doesn't fluctuate too much. That's good. Let's see if the track zero sensor works. Diagnostics diskette. Sensor is okay. Okay, so I think this is a working drive at least. That's a good sign. <laughs> it still is a bit noisy, but it does work. So that's good. I think I just want to add some more lubricant to this here. The spindle seems to make the noise. Yeah, that's a bit better. So I lubricated this rotating part here a bit more. Sprayed some silicon spray in there, some on here. And now it runs a lot smoother. And I also removed some more dirt from the mechanism. Yeah, actually runs a bit smoother now. Yeah, and the heatsink in the back here, you can feel that it gets pretty warm which is actually a good sign because our voltage regulators are transferring the heat to this heatsink, to this slab of aluminum that's on here. That's how it's supposed to be. I think we got the functional part of it absolutely back to pristine or nearly pristine, given that this was a super dirty drive. And it does play games too. <laughs> So I think the one thing that's left to do before putting this back together is to make this a bit smoother. And I'm just going to try to use this file carefully on the area to at least get rid of the brown spots there. Uh, this is a nail file thing that I'm using here. And yeah, there's a bit of plastic missing there. That's not good, but at least I'm going to try my best here to smooth this out a bit. <sighs> That's a bit better, I guess. Yeah, I think I'm going to leave it at that. It's a bit less brown than before. Okay, time to put it back together, if it still fits. Yep, that looks good. I'm going to put all the screws back in. And I'm turning these left for a bit before I screw them down. So uh, they snap into the original threads because I don't want to stress the plastic too much. And you don't want to over tighten these because this is an old and somewhat brittle device as we've seen. Yeah and even the label survived the process. You just don't want to rub <laughs> that part of the equation. Yeah it does look quite okay I guess. Not quite as good as new but this is as good as I can make this I guess. It has a few scratches but 
It's a functional Atari 1050 disk drive again. That's good. Yeah, I think that's it for today. Uh, revived the Atari 1050 and cleaned it up thoroughly. I hope you found this informative and maybe a bit entertaining. Thank you very much for your support on Patreon and on the channel memberships page and also your single donations, obviously. Hope to see you again on this channel sometime. I'm Jan Beta. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye!